today is a bit different. We're not really having a service. We're having a Fabrengen, which is a traditional Hasidic gathering on any occasion. And we are Spinoza Chavara, and today's date is 23rd of November. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. It's wonderful to gather together in this space where, where we can connect. Each of us is unique, yet united by a common purpose. In a world that often asks us to go it alone, here we create a space for connection, reflection, and shared humanity. A Fabrengen is more than just a gathering. It is an opportunity to be present with one another, to reflect on our journeys, and to acknowledge both the joys and challenges we face. This is a time to step away from the busyness of our lives and tune into the deeper rhythms of our spirits, our values, our purpose, and our shared aspirations. As we come together, we embrace the idea that our connection to each other and to the world around us is sacred. We do not rely on a divine figure, but we do recognize that within each of us is strength and ability to love, to create, to grow, and to heal. Our Fabrengen is a time for open-hearted conversations, for sharing stories and wisdom, and for learning from one another. Here, there are no judgments, only an invitation to speak from the heart, to listen with empathy, and to be present with one another in truth. So please take a moment of silent reflection to connect with your intentions privately. Think about what brings you here today, what do you hope to contribute, and what would you like to receive? May this gathering be an opportunity for each of us to feel seen, heard, and connected to something larger than ourselves. So take that moment to reflect. Fabringans usually have nigunim, wordless melodies, interspersed throughout them. So I'd like us to take the opportunity to listen to this one.
the great generational difference between traditional secularists and the present cultural Jews lies in the way they think about spirituality, because we recognize that we are more than our bodies, that we are different from the other animals in some qualitative way, and that we need rest and music and love. We have come to ask if we also need what is called a spiritual or religious experience, a feeling of congruence, order, and harmony the feeling of being part of something larger than our individual selves. This need may be hardwired into us, part of our human system, part of our need to make order out of a world of chaos. Secular and humanistic Jews are beginning to embrace the notion of spirituality because we want to be able to access that experience. Given that we have this need, how do we fulfill it? Why should we allow this basic part of our humanity to be separate from a basic part of our individual selves, our Jewishness? And let us explore the question, what is God optional spirituality? So um, each time we speak, we will wish our fellow congregants a lechaim and raise a toast. So as we start to think of our answers to the question, let us now raise a lechaim to life. So to me, a God optional spirituality means in some sense that there's a diversity within our community of approaches to spiritual questions uh, and even religious experience because if God is optional really implicit in that is that there are some people who are going to have nothing to do with God in terms of how they approach spirituality and then some people who are going to want to I'll say to use the language of God or approaches to God in some sense. Now, in a secular humanist community, I don't think you're going to find many people who are going to approach a supernatural God, you know, as their approach to God. But there are many different definitions of God out there. And I think that, um, uh, to me, in part, it's about having a diversity within our community when it comes to spiritual approaches, maybe even liturgical approaches, uh, too. And, and to respecting that kind of a diversity. Yeah, yes, uh, I, I, I agree with you totally, yeah. Um, does anybody want to respond? Or Chaim? Chaim. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think back to, uh, I think it was James in our last service mentioned that the view of God spans the gambit within um, humanistic Judaism. And um, so I personally don't have that much trouble with uh, certain theistic language. Personally, I don't. It's a matter of definition. Um, and for me, I don't mind the, um, I would say I'm, pantheistic leaning so the totality of reality is divine or the divine milieu or whatever you wish to call it um i'd also i'm sort of leaning towards non-dualism and will likely be getting a book by rabbi j michelson uh, god is everything the path of non-dual non-dual judaism i think that rings well with me it also sits well with some of my uh, vipassana practice in the past. I do meditation, and I do understand, uh, after studying a lot of uh, Buddhist texts and Asian works, often written by Jews, believe it or not, and um, that, uh, you know, everything is ultimately one, um, as the world or the universe is energy in the end. Uh, what we see as reality as somewhat deceptive, uh, when it goes right down to the atomic level, it's all energy and everything is one. <laughs> and so I'm okay with the idea. Um, per, on my own, person, you were talking about Siddur's uh, earlier. Um, I like using um, Heim, Heimstern's uh, Gates of Prayer. I know it's uh, an older version for the Reform uh, uh, Union. Uh, however, there's no mandate, as far as I understand, in the Reform tradition even, various synagogues some of them even use the classical reform siddur which is the old union prayer book and some use gates of prayer and some use mishkan tefillah it all depends on the congregation the, the union doesn't 
tell them you must use Mishkan to fill up. Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and you know, and I feel free to to use a cedar that resonates with me. Um, although I do have copies of an Orthodox one, just to more for research and to look up interesting uh, things. Um, but the language to me uh, espouses too many things that I couldn't really uh, say and believe them. <laughs> and um, you know, I've just finished reading about the the life of Isaac Mayer Wise and uh, his struggles when he was developing uh, trying trying to build American Judaism. And uh, you know, he received problems both from the Orthodox side on one hand and the radical reform on the other hand. And I, it mentioned him sitting in a conference and them saying, well, you don't believe in a personal, personal Messiah and you don't believe in resurrection of the dead. And he said, no, I don't. <laughs> Which put him right <laughs> at odds with the Orthodox in the room. But of course, I was, I'm just sort of laughing when I read it because I'm going, yep, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> and most of the Jewish people I know that I personally know don't. Um, so it's just, um, but but the God experience is to me um, seeing the divine in everything. I know it's somewhat, um, and, and apparently a lot of the ascetic traditions um, espouse this view because they tended to um, focus more on the eminence of the divine as opposed to the transcendence. And also I tend to prefer language that is not anthropomorphic. So I'll stay away from language that refers to God as father or king or, you know, human uh, words. I don't know, uh, archetypes. I prefer, you know, words like cosmic majesty and the eternal oneness of the universe and stuff like that. Anyway, those are just some of my thoughts that I thought I would share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. So people can jump in and respond to anything that has just been said by Jamie or Jonathan or share your own thoughts or expand on something. Personally, um, uh, there's, there's a, there's a part of, of me that even struggles when I hear, hear the word God optional, um, because of religious trauma, uh, growing up and, um, and there's a part of me that that rejects rejects that like there's you know I've I've I've, I've struggled I've gone back and forth oscillated um, with feeling comfortable that some people believe in a God and that I you know if it makes them happy and and makes their life better then I should be comfortable with that but then there's other times where I'm just like any belief in the God is is you know is wrong is not is not healthy and and. It, it's one of those things where I, I'm still even, even though I've been out of uh, my former religion for uh, like 13 years now, I still struggle with with this with trying to find a balance where I can accept that other people do uh, identify with a, di a divine being of some sort, and um, but that being said, I I think my my views, my beliefs are more akin to Jamie's. It's kind of a scientific pantheism, just acknowledging the wonder of the universe and, and everything. And, and the more that we understand it, the more beautiful and wondrous it is. And uh, that, that sort of oneness, that unified, um, uh, you know, the, the unified theory of the universe being uh, like everything being connected. I, I, I think that there's a lot of beauty in that. And so, I can at least take solace in that, even as I struggle with this trauma that I've that I've had. Yeah, I I hear that. Um, and there are people in the movement who, for that very reason, um, are very against uh, the idea of a God option in our services. And so, personally, as an uh, um, as a celebrant, I somebody who's gone through uh, the leadership course, I uh, had to sign something that says I will not use the, the word God in, in, in services that I lead um, within an uh, SHJ context, at least. Um, and I completely understand and agree with the reasons because, yes, religious trauma is uh, very real for a lot of people. 
Um, and I think that we get, I think that a flip side to that, in a sense, is that uh, we uh, we think that secular and spirituality become opposing concepts. Um, some people think that at least, and they think that we should completely uh, disavow any language that looks or sounds um, religious, you know? Um, and I think there's, of course, not that's not what you were saying. It's just my reflection that I think that for some people, um, that kind of blurring the lines between spirituality and religion can become something that holds us back as a community. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if that makes sense uh, to, or that speaks to what you were just saying. Um, it, I sure. think it absolutely <laughs> does. I, yeah. I think it absolutely speaks to it. And like, it's funny you mentioned that because I experienced this both here um, in Judaism and then in Unitarian Universalism. In Unitarian yeah. Universalism, they use a term all the time that I have a lot of trauma around, which is covenant. Um, mm. In in the Mormon world, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of uh, covenants that you make that mm. a lot of trauma around those. And then um, and then uh, in Judaism, there's a lot of talk. Um, and, and thankfully, we don't hear it as much um, in humanistic Judaism, but there's a lot of talk about being God's people. Um, and there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles. And th that's all language that, you know, has been appropriated by Mormonism. And so, you know, I, I definitely relate to what you're talking about. Mm, sure. Yeah, so I think that part of what we're doing um, by defining ourselves as a spiritual humanistic community, humanistic Jewish community at Spinoza Chavarat is trying to heal some of those wounds, that, that trauma that people have. Um, yeah. Uh, Phyllis, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, and we haven't done a Lechaim for a while, so sooner or later somebody else needs to do one. <laughs> Lechaim. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I have a lot of religious trauma based on having um, been brought up in very fundamental Christian faith. Um, and some of my trauma, um, sometimes I feel like I'm being re-traumatized by all the efforts to not use language. Um, you know, it's like I appreciate everybody's efforts to not say this and not say that and not say this and not say that. But um, for me, you know, um, spirituality in and of itself is separate from religion. And, you know, all the efforts to not say something, I feel that effort in and of itself. And sometimes that's traumatizing too, you know, um, just, just, I mean, you know, it's very obvious that we're not trying to say certain things, you know, it's very obvious that we're not you know, and it would just be more natural to just say what you say and feel what you feel and do what you do and just accept the people that say what they say and feel what they feel and do what they do, you know. And um, I don't know, sometimes I think the intentionality of of not doing something becomes just as traumatizing as doing it. Um, I, I, I appreciate the effort. I really do. But sometimes it's just not as natural as we think it is to not do something. Um, and yet I understand it. I understand it. I completely get it. Um, but there have been times when I just wished, you know, you know, substituting other words seems not natural and doing other, saying other things or not saying things is not natural and I just, I don't know, when are we going to get to the point when it's just okay to say what you say and do what you do, and we just accept the person that says or does that. Um, when I first start going around um, certain synagogues, I would be the only person that didn't stand at a certain part of a service because that was not how I felt or practiced, and it was noticed, and people would come and say, well, you know, in this congregation, we stand at that part. I said, well, I don't. 
<laughs> you know, and and after a while, it became okay with the congregation. Oh well, she just doesn't stand. That's okay, you know. And after a while, that was okay. It was natural for them to understand that I just don't. I don't do that part, and they all got okay with it. And you know, that's the part I'm waiting on. I'm waiting on it to be okay for us to all understand that maybe that person says God, or maybe that person does this or doesn't do that and it's okay we don't all have to freak out or have some visceral response to it it's okay that person does it or that person doesn't do it it's okay then we'll all be all right then we'll all be spiritually okay when we can accept everybody's okayness <laughs> do you uh, think that, <laughs> yeah, look, hi, hi. Do, do you think that we uh, in some ways there is a trend towards like an well not towards but there is a trend of um orthodox humanistic judaism in yes. the sense of yes like <laughs> yes <laughs> for example i've been asked why are you wearing a kippah you know and it was like well because i want to um really? and and for some that's like well yes but you know that could be traumatizing for some people and and I just and I kind of think, well, well, lots of things can be traumatizing for a lot of people, um, and for you know this kind of you shouldn't wear a kippah or you know you you should. It's the same as like Rabbi Miriam the other day said, um, we don't ask. Well, not Rabbi Miriam. Rabbi Eva Goldberg said, we don't ask ask people why they're wearing a particular color of tie. Why would we ask them why? They're wearing a exactly. kippah or a tali. Yeah. Um, right. Why can't you wear your kippah? It means something to you. You should be able to do that and it should not be questioned. We should be okay with right. it because it is personal and means something to you. Right. Exactly. And we should love you and accept you enough that we are all we all look at that and say, whatever, it means something to him. You know, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. that's his practice. Yeah. And I can't I would be traumatized rather... by your practice. That's your practice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would rather be in a community where we are allowed to do those things. You know, like yes. when I've led services in person in the UK uh, on a few occasions, um, I've had a box of kipot and I've offered them to everyone. And women look at me and go, am I supposed to wear a kippah? And I say, you're supposed to wear one if you want to wear one and not wear one right. if you don't want to wear one. Same for everybody in the room, you know? Right. And I, I'd rather be in a community like that than one where people say you must wear one or you must not wear one. Exactly. I, I wore Orthodox, traditionally Orthodox, um, you know, Talid and Kipot. For many, many years I did. And I stopped because people shamed me, people questioned me, but it was so important to me to do it because I am the only Jew in my family. I am the only person in my family who can carry those traditions. And so it was important to me to represent all of those traditions and carry them. I have no children. I will never have any children. There is no male in my family to do that for me. I am not married. I will not ever be married. Let's be clear about it, y'all. Hear me say it. Um, you know, so it was important to me to practice those things, to understand what they were and, and, and to do it and to represent in my tribe uh, those traditions. And I got so much criticism that I just stopped doing it because other people couldn't handle it. Mm. And that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. You know, but I did it when I was in the military. For eight years, I wore kippot, I wore talit, I did all of that. But when I came home to America, I had to stop doing it here in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Go get it. Forget it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, I am. I'm done. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Go ahead, Yosef. Um, shit, no, I lost my point of thought. Uh, you know what? Go back. Go to someone else while I, my thought comes back to me. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. 
Martine, I didn't have my hand up, but I just That's wanted okay. to ask you something. Um, I respect that trauma is real, but I don't want it to be conflated with discomfort. And when you say some people were traumatized because you wore a kippah, that does not resonate with me. Uh, how could that cause trauma to anyone? Uh, discomfort? Yeah, okay. Um, could you please clarify that? Um, well, I mean, it's been in conversations where people have said that it can be traumatizing. Um, do, you, do you expect that? Do you believe that? That's weird. It's not for me. I, I don't think it's for me to negate what somebody else describes as trauma, um, because it may very well be that it's it it can remind them of trauma that they've had. You know, women okay. who women okay. who have grown up not being able to participate fully with the men in their family, and they and then they go to a space where they can be completely free uh, to express themselves and to speak however they want, and then. And then they see somebody and they, uh, they're they wearing a kippah and they think, okay, I mean, it may not, it may be something that they might need to heal from, but it, it doesn't mean it's not trauma. Does that make sense? And I think there's sort a... Sort of, but you see, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the, the, the perspective of what Phyllis was saying before is do we always have to be so careful of words that we don't intend to hurt that we fail to communicate at all? So do you have to be so attuned to the fact that maybe somebody will react with pain to your keeper that you shouldn't wear? I mean, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't make sense to me. Well, no, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it means I shouldn't wear one. I think it means... Um that they have something they need to work out. Um, okay. But I think, okay, I'll but go I, with that. yeah, but I think that having that, having these conversations is part of that because for sure there are people present who might resonate more with that trauma uh, or that emotion that has been expressed as trauma. Okay. Uh, Skip? Yeah, I wanted to, to respond to that as well and say that, um, the example I have is from the Unitarian Universalist community where I, I brought up the trauma that I have around the word covenant. And they've, they've been explicit in saying, Rachel, that, that, they, that they're sorry that I experienced that trauma and that, they, that, that my trauma is valid and it's real, but that they're not gonna back away from that term because, because the term has meaning for them the word has meaning for them and and it can be used in powerful ways that are not that have nothing to do with the with the, the trauma that I experienced. And I think that the same is true of the kippah that uh, Martin you know wears and 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 offered others to wear. The trauma that those people experienced was real and is valid, but that but that doesn't mean that you can't move forward. I think also of the word queer. Um, you know that's been successfully reappropriated. That's a term that caused, you know, trauma for generations of people, um, and yet now it's a very empowering term that is used by societies um, to to represent an entire group of people, and they they identify with that, and and they proud they proudly now say, "I am queer." Yeah. Um. I had a thought on that as you were speaking, um, but I'll wait for Yosef. Okay, I remember my thought. And um, the, there's a foundational assumption in a lot of this conversation that I think it's bugging me. And it's something I noticed even when I was reading the, the, um, the, humanistic judaism a to z guide you know the one i'm talking about i can't remember the proper title the guide to humanistic judaism which is that a lot of these um like secular 
definitions and secular conceptualizations are kind of a reaction to Christian semantics packed into a lot of these words that just don't apply to Judaism. But because so much of what the Western world understands about Judaism is through a Christian lens, through the Old Testament lens, people just kind of react to that. And I find that this kind of secular, uh, sacred dichotomy is a little artificial and a product of the Enlightenment. And I think that as we struggle to deal with some of the contradictions and those assumptions, we find ourselves bending over backwards, trying to like be like, well, we're going to do this, but like not religiously. And I think we end up kind of finding our landing into what we call religious behavior. And then we, we get like, ah, oh, we can't, it's too, too religious. And it's, and it's, I think it's important to remember that in Judaism, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a concern about up and out into, into the supernatural heaven so much as even within Orthodox Judaism manifesting the sacred here on earth. You know, it's important to remember that Judaism concerns itself with material existence, not so much trying to get your soul to heaven even in an orthodox setting. So like, you know, for me, I take a, a, a really big page out of Spinoza's um, ideology because, you know, he was kind of the arch atheist of his day and simultaneously accused of being a man drunk on God. And how is this so? You know, and it's because it's Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Echad, right? You know, God is one. And you have to think about what that entails if God is one. And and you pack all that together. And you begin to see like, oh, all these bad things are also inherent in what is, we call the divine, right? And part of like being Israel to wrestle with God means to uh, think about, well, what do we do about that? And I think one of the things that I've noticed about Jews is that they don't have the fuzziest relationship with Hashem. Um, it's more like a partnership, and it's more like, uh, it's it, it, he's capricious. It's capricious. It's less fuzzy. And I like that because it's honest. It's honest because, that like, it's human, you know? And granted, you know, we as secular, not, uh, uh, like, spiritual humanists, I guess, some of us, some of us more secular. Um, I think... It's um, uh, I think that's all I got for right now. I, I think I'm losing my train of thought, but I, I'm hoping you're picking up what I'm putting down. You know, absolutely, yeah. Um, I I really like that you brought up the enlightenment and the secular spiritual <clears throat> split. Um, not to misquote you there, but um, you know what I mean. Um, because I actually uh wrote a paper for part of my leadership course on on that and and how it kind of plays into an ashkenormative view of um of the relationship between religion and uh secularism among as it, it that it, that it's an ashkenazi kind of um problem so to speak because um for for sephardim um especially western sephardim minhag the tradition was always more important than belief and so people could fully participate in the orthodox uh, in, in the synagogue community um and nobody would question uh to to their belief in god or not or whether they were following halakha jewish law in their private life um there are people who would be you know totally not following halakha. Uh, I, I know people who are queer and have tattoos um, of mixed ancestry, but who are members of Spanish Portuguese community and, and lead services. Uh, and nobody says to them that you're not allowed to have tattoos. Or you're not allowed to be married to a man if you're a man, etc. Nobody says that to them. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that everything is rosy and everything is perfect in the Sephardi world, far from it. But there are these kinds of elements of Sephardi, the way that Sephardim observe Judaism, 
with a focus on tradition that kind of completely uh, bypasses um, bypasses this secular spirituality kind of religion split. Um, and and there are numerous books about how secular versus religion um, is a Eurocentric idea as well. Um, that for many in many communities, the split is not is not present. It's not seen as something that is one or the other. Um, so I'm really I'm really glad that you raised that actually. And I have more thoughts, but I don't want to I don't want to. Uh, um, what's the word? go on about it too much. <laughs> um, so we need a Lechayim. Lechayim. <laughs> uh, Aaron? Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> yeah, this, um, I love the idea of a community uh, which could uh, is open enough <clears throat> excuse me, to be a hodgepodge uh, and not trying to force or forbid uh, people, um, you know, forcing into one or another custom or tradition. I love that word multi-traditional. I mean, traditions in the sense of customs and is it Ashkenazi? Is it Sephardi? Is it, you know, whatever? Uh, it reminds me of when I, for a while, was into uh, Sephardic Breslov or Breslov, yeah. So I was into that also in my journey of uh, sampling different cults. Um, and so... But yeah, I can totally, re I've talked about it before, I totally resonate with the uh, the discussion of trauma. Um, and of course, my therapist, you know, explains that the way out is, is uh, through. And so, um, but of course, one, it's through exposure you know, little bits of exposure that one can um, become eventually uh, back to homeostasis and can come, you know, like can absorb and assimilate through practice um, these things. So I have, you know, all the Orthodox get up still in a drawer and in a closet. So perhaps one day, I'll show up and put on to fill in and you know <laughs> whatever. Um, so we'll we'll see if I feel like that. I saw a, a little reel this morning of um, Dr. Brian Green, a physicist, string theorist, and he was talking to Charlie Rose on the Charlie Rose show. Um, in, and it was a clip from 1999 when I graduated from grad school and moved from Oklahoma back to Dallas, Texas. And um, he was talking about string theory. And for those of us who were into the uh, Tao of physics, and the Wu Li Mas the dancing Wu Li Masters, and D Rabbi Brad Artson, um, you know we love and the whole and Kushner Rabbi Harold Kushner the whole pro process theology for all of us who love process theology, the the energy the flowing uh, music of the universe of the energy strings, it's so beautiful. Uh, you know, Carl Sagan and the cosmos and just such cool stuff. Um, and uh, it, it just really feeds my heart in a way sometimes. Um, and then as was pointed out in the comments, you know, it's 2024. Um, and it turned out scientifically 
uh, string theory just couldn't bring home the the proof. They just couldn't. You just couldn't test it. You couldn't find it. Um, and it just makes it a beautiful and elegant mathematical poetry. It's not science. It ended up having to, you know, it's so useful to teach students, I'm told, by I'm not I'm not good at math, so I'm not a physicist by the any. I'm not good at math. But that's what I'm told by science uh people is that um it was it's so beautiful and so useful to teach and educationally. Uh and it just didn't end up being testable science. And so for me, me I love meditation. I love Buddhism as well. You know, all that stuff. Um, but, uh, and I love humanistic Judaism. So, um, and I, and of course I'm a member of a reform congregation as well. Like a lot of people are a member of some, main quote local mainstream you know reconstructionist or, or renewalist reb zalman we did that for a while anyway it's just but do i want to spend my time with things that are my time and money on things that are not real um do you go to movies yeah okay good wonderful point i love uh i watch anime and all kinds of you know we're big fans of sci-fi and anim japanese animation and and stuff like that so you know lord of the rings etc yeah we love um but women's rights to their own health care have not been removed by lord of the rings nerds um, they're being removed by religious nuts who are killing women, especially in Texas, uh, well, not exclusively. And it's going to get worse. And they just voted in a dictatorship. So it does matter. Religion does kill. Um, and so i that's the one thing I didn't mean to get angry. I don't know why that comment. Well, I'm, I'm noticing anger arising uh yes i i do not want a poet poetry free you know cleansed mr spock science no fun imagination stories that's i don't want that world of because i did that too uh the rom bomb it was the whole throw out all you know super rationalists the rationalist orthodox we did that i went on that crazy kick so yes i love fantasy and poetry um and i think the exact expression of forbidding uh say a woman just for as an example to do something in this community whether it's you can't put on a kippah you you should shouldn't you can't you could you know i think i, I do agree that of this that forbidding you know people i would hate for us to vote to ban somebody for doing something obviously unless they're somehow harmful and disruptive to the group anyway i will pass hugs to everyone thank you aaron for your thoughts i there are a few hands but um i want to quickly um read something from a website called baitkaplan.org which is the house of kaplan talking about Mod rabbi mordechai kaplan and he says in modern times especially after the holocaust many jews began to reject the idea of a supernatural god god as a supernatural person entirely they wondered whether as a result they could still call themselves jews rabbi mordechai kaplan who died in 1983 the originator of reconstructionist judaism presented a new approach. He wrote, in essence, th that what God is, is irrelevant. There have always been lots of ideas about the nature of God, but the essential thing is how God functions. 
if God is to be um, a path to a positive, meaningful, moral world, then what God does is all important. Whatever impels a person to work toward justice, to be honest, to seek wisdom, to act generously, to help build a good society, that force is God. No further description is needed. So it's like that last that last uh, sentence, whatever impels a person to work, to work towards justice, to be honest, to seek wisdom, to act generously, to help build a good society, that force is God. No, dis no further description is needed. And I think um, that, I mean, there's a lot more to unpack in that, <laughs> but um, for me, that's quite a good um, statement to work around. I don't use the term God, but I understand what that, I understand what that concept in that sentence is. And I think that's more going along the lines of Spinoza. So I just wanted to throw that in there because we're, it's part of what we're talking about. Um, and but first, I see Stephen, Jeffrey, and Jonathan's hands. Um, are there any other hands up? No, Stephen, Jeffrey, and Jonathan in that order. So go ahead, Stephen. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Stephen from Scotland. Um, I'm just new. It's first, really. I'm doing the adoption tuition with Martin at the moment. We're just kind of getting into that um, just now, which has been really good. I um, don't really know what else to say. <laughs> but yeah, it's just good to be here. And I'm really enjoying like hearing everyone's different perspectives. And I come from, I'm not Jewish by background. I come from originally a Catholic family, but I never practiced it was more my parents and um, especially my dad that was um, practicing in that but this is where my journey into finding what I like has brought me so yeah it's good to be here and nice to meet you all. <laughs> You're welcome Stephen, nice to have you here. Funnily enough Stephen is from, he meant, uh, he, he didn't mention but Glasgow um and uh glasgow has a very traditional jewish community and one time i was leading a service in a liberal synagogue uh and it was going to be god optional um and before this one person from glasgow had ever attended he said oh i i, I won't come because there will be too much english so it wasn't it wasn't that you're not going to mention god or you're not it's not going to be traditional it was there will be too much English so that's a real consideration that a lot of people have in services that they don't want they don't want there to be a lack of Hebrew in the service I don't know uh Jeffrey um I, I've been enjoying these um uh things that people have been sharing um I'm a strong atheist so I don't believe in God uh, to the point where I'm willing to go around saying that and uh, uh, argue with people about it. I'm like, like kind of annoying atheist. Um, and I'm not even quite sure if spirituality is a thing to the point where I, I say I don't even believe it's a thing, but I'm still here um, singing songs and um, I go to uh, other um, services and I'll participate in everything. I go right through the entire uh Sidur with uh the reform synagogue I like to go to. Um and also there's a renewal one I go through theirs. <laughs> and then uh, I'm in a um spirituality circle. I do all the assignments. <laughs> Show up to all the meetings. <laughs> um but yeah it's I still not sure what I'm doing. <laughs> um and then I also participate in inter interfaith activities a lot. Um, there's um, uh, sort of like a, a, a Zoom group where, um, or Zoom organization where they do these workshops with panels of Muslims, Sikhs, uh, Christian ministers, um, rabbis, <laughs> etc. And I'll participate and talk to all of them and uh, just try to understand where everyone's coming from, what, what their belief systems are. Um, I, I don't like to uh, discount someone's belief system because I, I could be wrong. I mean, it, it, it's possible. I'm often wrong about a lot of things. Um, and then 
uh, I'll, I'll sign up for these things as an atheist. So they, they know what they're getting into if they looked. Um, also, I joined a um, poll watching organization called Face United as an atheist. I worked with all those different ministers, priests, and whatever. Yeah, there was a Franciscan monk, <laughs> and and we were we were cool. Um, but I'm okay with people who uh, believe in God. Um, I have uh, friends uh, who are very religious. Uh, for example, uh, some Seventh Day Adventist friends invited me over for dinner. Um, they wanted to close out the Sabbath with prayers and readings, and they asked, is this okay? And I'm like, yes, I want the full experience of being here. Just do what you normally do. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not there to pass judgment on that, you know. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I had readings for Yom Kippur where I had to talk about God. I just did the readings, I mean, I, I didn't, like, not do it. Um, I'm obviously still myself, <laughs> but I agreed to do the readings. So I did my readings, and that's that's what I wanted to share. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and Lechaim, everyone. Um, Jonathan, I tried posting this in the chat, but I was um, you're you're very muffled. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, you can't. All right. Now we can. Yes. Now, now we can. Yes. Okay. I tried posting this in the chat, but was having some trouble doing that. I think. Um, I I think part of what goes on, or the challenge within the humanistic movement of building a kind of spirituality where God is optional, is that the founder uh, Sherwin Wine and some others were so insistent that God had to refer to a supernatural being. So the move that liberal theologians make, like uh, Mordecai Kaplan and others to say, well, God could be a force for good or something like that. I'm just gonna read a quote from Kaplan. I, I tried to post it, I hope this won't be too long, but he wrote, redefining God in those kinds of ways, right? Is immoral, immoral, because ordinary words are entitled to their ordinary meanings. God is an old word with an old historic de denotation. For the ordinary user, God refers to a supernatural father figure who made and runs the world and occasionally interferes with its operation. The vocabulary of prayer is directed to a personal power who can respond to praise and petition. Even after all the liberal theists redefine God to their personal satisfaction and social comfort, even after they insist that the term refers not to some non-anthropomorphic natural force for goodness or creative energy, they still end up talking about it as though it were a popper figure. I'm gonna go ahead. It is immoral to steal words from their everyday communication and to alter their meaning arbitrarily, especially if the action serves your personal advantage. Theology is a cloak for atheists like an emperor's clothing in an Anderson fairy tale. It's shoddy business. So, Cap, I'm sorry. So, Wine, more to, I'm sorry, Sherwin Wine was deeply insistent that we shouldn't make these moves that what you would call that God could be an energy in the world, a power for salvation, a force for oneness, all these. God could be love, if you will. His view was if you want to talk about love, talk about love, right? But the God is a word with meaning, and this movement really should stay away from that meaning. Now, I, I don't like his move. I think it's too dogmatic. But I think there are some within the humanist world who essentially have Kaplan's response that if you, if you want to talk about things about love or goodness or the power within humanity to, to do ethics or whatever, let, let's get out of the business of using the language of the divine for that. Of course, there are other people like in the Reconstructionist movement, it's precisely the reverse. That's exactly the intellectual moves they want to make. I know that was long, but... It, it, it wasn't long at all. Nechaim, nechaim. I, I don't think it was long at all, and um, I, I think it's very interesting. Um, yeah. Yosef, you, you wrote that you disagree with Sherwin Wine. Yeah, I think that's the, a dogmatic um, assumption, and he's wrong. I'm, I'm just going to say he's wrong um, because words don't have inherent meaning. Words mean what people agree they mean. 
Um, and yes. the semantic content of what words mean changes from place to place. As soon as words leave your mouth, they don't inherently carry meaning <laughs> flying across the... It, it only carries meaning once the person who hears the message decrypts it with the semantic content of the words that they understand it to mean. And like, if I go to a KFC in England and, and try and order biscuits, I'm going to get very confused looks. And then I'm going to try and describe a biscuit and utterly fail because of how the hell do I describe an American biscuit? Like, uh, it's a scone, but it's not, you know? And the thing is, is like, I kind of reject this idea of Aristotelian, you know, uh, like minimum qual qualifications of being a, a concept. Uh, I, I subscribe to the theory of uh, uh, prototype theory. Things exist along a, a spectrum, uh, and they are more of of things' essence. Like a a banana is a fruit, so is an olive. But which one's fruitier? What does that even mean, right? And you know, like so. And to Cap uh, Wine's point about you know we want to talk about love. Talk, let's talk about love. Um, well, okay, let's talk about that. Uh, let's go back to, you know, the original covenant that was made with Abraham. Love God with all your heart. What does that mean? Right? Well, we, we have an idea of what love and all your heart means in modern American English. But if you start scratching at the surface of what that means between, uh, from an ancient Hebrew perspective, love, uh, had a connotation more to do with like political loyalty and heart well, anciently, the heart was what we th is what they thought the brain was. They thought all mo all of thoughts and uh, ideation happened in here because they didn't understand biology. So, what they what that phrase is saying is be loyal to the God of Israel with, you know, and understand that. That's why there's this such this uh, this, this tradition of, of study with all your heart, or you know, mind. And like the word God for me is problematic because like that's a German word that's, you know, like it, it's not even a word that really when you unpack the semantic content of it doesn't even really necessarily apply to the, the to the concept of, of Hashem and things like that. And like the way I, I, I approach it and I'll, and I'll get off this topic is very naturalistically, you know, I don't have a belief in the supernatural whatsoever. Uh, my my concept of, of divinity is rooted in the the. Uh, cognitive psychology divine images um uh, so the way I, I look at it and is that what we think of as divine images you know god are, are essentially manifestations of collective psychological motivations um you know the 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 sacred object that we strive for is it materially existent no but it is these cognitive psychological images are contingent on material forces and they do not exist apart from these material forces and you know so like if you want to talk about things have to mean what they mean well then no you can decide that for yourself um and i'm saying that as someone who came from a really radically different spiritual tradition prior to this as an occultist chaos magic which doesn't require belief in god um you know, you can believe whatever you want, and you can change those beliefs. And the way you change those beliefs can change your reality. So, no, I reject this notion that things have to be the way they have to be. They don't. Thank you. Um, you see, I I heard uh, there's a there's a person called Clive Lawton in the UK. He started Limud, the Limud movement. Um, I I think you also have it in in the Americas. Um, but um, he said in a in a, a lecture last year um that the problem with jews is that we uh don't use jewish terms anymore so we say god when we really yes. mean your table and yeah um and we we say prayer when we really mean filler um etc cetera, etc cetera. and he's hilarious and he made he made people laugh because he said how do you explain to a non-jewish friend what what Shabbat is? Oh, I can't work on Saturday, but it's not Saturday. It's Friday night to Saturday night, and and how do you you know how do you kind of explain that? And then Torah. What does Torah mean? What learning or law? 
So then what about Simchat Torah, the joy of law? And then we're all dancing around saying, oh, we've got the law. <laughs> like it just makes us look like crazy people. Um, and and that I think that for me is like something that started a journey for me very early on, because like I mentioned, I was influenced by Kaplan a long time ago and I still am influenced by him. And um, I started to look at the Siddur and think, OK, but what are we saying when we say, oh, you know, hero Israel, you, you know, and you will love you will love your Vavhe with all your heart, all your might, and all of your muchness, because meodecha means your your muchness, all of all of that which you are. What what is that? Because if your Vavhe is a force of life, um, then what is the end result that we're trying to achieve when we say, I will, I will love that force with all my heart and my might and my muchness. And I kind of thought, okay, what's the underlying message beneath this? kind of concept um and and then the tefillah the prayer etc and i and i really i really think that this is for many people the problem that it's the english words that traumatize i would say and um and that's why very often people will say to me but you don't believe in god so why are you quote unquote religious or spiritual and I and I and I will say, yeah, I don't believe in the English word God, for sure. But if we're going to talk about Yote Vavhe as a a force of life, then that's a conversation we can have. It doesn't necessarily mean that I believe the same thing about that—that that it's an entity or that it's a person or that it exerts um, command or commands me to do anything. But it is. A deeper conversation that I can't have about the word God because for me the word God is finished it's like it's not a concept that I get I can be on board with um and I'm sorry again I see hands um uh skip oh I, yeah skip thank you um so uh, as far as um to to your point, Yosef, I'll I'll say that um, uh, that I don't know necessarily that uh, Rabbi uh, Sherman Wine would would it, it would be opposed to a kind of post structuralist deconstructionist um, view of of language like you're describing. Um, I think that he would be saying, and I don't think that he'd be opposed to individual interpretations of the word God, um, you know, as love, as, you know, force for good, et cetera. I think that he's talking about in a community context um, because there's, because of um, all the baggage that comes with it for us to, to, to use the terminology God. And in, in like, this is one reason why I struggle with reconstruction services. I still go to them because that's the closest community I have in person to what I, to what I believe. But, um, you know, I still struggle with the language, the yod he vav he uh, language that they use because there's a history there. There's a, there, you know, there, there are, communal definitions that are carried with that term and and even within that community they 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 don't collectively agree that god is love god is a force um they do continue to express god as i guess you know i don't know if i would say corporeal being but they do continue to express god as being the supernatural you know divine entity this deity and because the community continues to express that, you know, for us to pretend that it's something else, uh, uh, you know, I think that that's where he's coming in with the immorality. And I always return to what he said, um, where he, where he said, you know, we we say what we mean and we mean what we say, um, or you know, I I might have it reversed, but the point is, is that there there's a clarity that comes with avoiding the term god because we don't have all that history all that baggage all that um every, everything that comes with that and i think that that now do i have a problem or do i have an issue with people individually um seeing god as a force for love god as a force for good the collective um 
you know, psychological archetypes, like you said, Yosef. Um, no, I don't individually, but as a community, like the, I think that it becomes extremely problematic for us to use God language um, because of the, you know, everything that comes with that. Uh, that was just some of the thoughts that I had, but Martin, you know, you also have made me kind of step back and ask myself questions about, do I have an issue with the English term God? Do I, do I have the same issue with yod heh vav -Hey? I think so, but, uh, or Adonai as well. Um, but uh, I think you definitely have made me question, you know, have I have I even begun to approach this from a Jewish standpoint, rather than just simply a Christian one, like I've been exposed to previously? Okay, so I don't think that anybody should or should not think or believe anything. Um, by the way, um, if you are completely uncomfortable with either term, either the Hebrew or the English, then that's fine. You know um it's up to you and it's for you to define and i think that's i think that's why we're involved what we're involved in is an important movement because um we do offer a different language and and we don't offer the language of uh yod -Hey -Vav -Hey or god or and adonai certainly because adonai means my lords um it's not even my lord it's uh kind of hard to explain but it's yeah it's like an honorific that refers to a lord um and okay i quite like the fact that we don't write traditionally the full name yod -Hey -Vav -Hey. um and i quite like the fact that we kind of rephrase it and say something else and hamakom is one of the words that a lot of people say the place or the the what's the another word for that the status or the level for example um and i think a lot of this conversation is very interesting but you know i just i don't think that we yeah i i think that we need to be intellectually honest about these terms and i think that's why we're having a conversation like this but i also want to kind of um challenge us a little bit to say okay if we accept that we're in a movement where God language is at least optional, um, what is the value then? What is the inherent value that we can find or that we can make um, in our observances, in our practices? What language does work for us as a community? Um, you know, because I observe Shabbat. I consider myself Shomer Shabbat to a certain extent. I, not from an Orthodox perspective, because, you know, Havdalah has passed and I'm on my laptop. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's neither here nor there. But, you know, there is an inherent value that I find and that, that I see in Shabbat. And for some people, that's already religious. As soon as you say, I like the candles at the halakhic time, then you're already religious, no matter what. Um, so I just kind of want to want us to think after Jonathan, um, uh, maybe a little bit about what is that God optional spirituality that we can find value in. Of course, if Rabbi Jonathan says something that people want to respond to, you can feel free to do so. <laughs> I just want to uh, follow some what Skip was saying, but this comes through in other comments as well. To me, a lot of it deals with what we do as a community, not just as private individuals, you know, in our personal lives. I don't think the humanistic Jewish world would say to any person, you can't really have your own personal conception of God that you want to look, look with. It's much more about what are we going to use in our collective expressions. And to me, it's a bit like, I would say the challenge is a bit like halakha in that there's a world where you go to the services and it's all God. We come in to praise God, we thank God, we petition God. It's a God-centered, centered service. You know, that's, that's everything really from reform typically to the more traditional. 
And then there's another approach is you can come to a humanistic service and we don't touch the word God. And when I think of something like halakha, I like to avoid that binary personally. I don't think you have to be, the only use of halakha is to be uh, an Orthodox or an ultra Orthodox Jew. And if you're not, you're just a nothing when it comes to halakha. I think you can have a more mature relationship to it. And I think there could be within the humanistic world, or even if it's not in humanistic Judaism, within some branch of Judaism, some, um, some collective expression that allows for more polyvocality that says, you know, we all want to see uh, more justice in the world. Some of us turn to our reason to do that. Some of us uh, reach out to God to get the strength of that. Wherever you find that spiritual strength, like, you know, we, we honor that or something like that. But the, that kind of very binary, and I think that's part of what goes on, is, is not something I enjoy vis-a-vis -vis halacha. And I actually don't really think it works so well uh, in terms of God language either. Thank you. And I think that I think that um, halakha is a really good example because it means way, right? Af. It doesn't mean it's a really good example of this, like using non-Jewish language to describe something Jewish and how it doesn't work. Because what is halakha in English? Most people would say Jewish law, you know, um, and both Jews and non-Jews would call that Jewish uh, Jewish law and reform. And in the UK, we have liberal movements as well. You know, liberal and reformed Jews both um, say that we don't have halakha. And I and I've always kind of thought, well, I really disagree with that idea. You do have halakha, <laughs> you know, uh, you just don't think you do. And I don't know why it is that they're not having this conversation in a more open way. And 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 yeah, um, we. It's just, um, I mean, Yosef said this as well. Was it you, Yosef, that brought this up about language? It was, right? Semantic, the semantic, the semantics of a word matter. Was is that what you said, Yosef? Yeah, people are saying yes. Yeah, um, because I mean, I'm a linguist as well, and I do endangered language work, and and my and half of my family speak an endangered language. And in some cases, we have words which have the total semantic opposite. So, like the meaning in our, in ours is a total opposite in the in the dominant language from which it's um, evolved separately, um, and in, and that can cause some very difficult situations. Um, and I find myself hearing people speaking um, the dominant language and and the standardized version of the language, and I hear them saying things that are quite almost shocking to me at times because I think you've just used the exact same word as I would use in the exact same structure and the same grammar and morphology and everything. Um, but what you have just said has a completely different meaning in my language. Um, and so that's in, so that's why it's, uh, do you get what I'm saying? I kind of lost my point a little bit, but yeah, God, God can mean something to one person and and another thing to another person. And so Sherwin Wine, his comments have not, you know, really taken that into consideration. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I see hands. Uh, I think there's more hands. Who's who's got their hand up? Uh, Aaron. Aaron has his hand up. And now Aaron Paula. and Paula and Betty Ann. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I like, uh, yeah, you, you bringing up that the study of languages and how meanings change, um, over the centuries, I guess, or even generations. Um, and I think that's relevant, of course, to our discussion, obviously. Uh, but I want to also ask about the, um, free thinker skeptic the skeptic um humanistic approach to to Judaism um that this movement or or, or that this group represents um because I think it's I, I mean I I'm interested I'm more interested instead of arguing over these 
to this topic of God, the meaning of God, the word of God. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to help spread the beauty of free thinking of the scientific method. Um, and I don't, I, I lost what I was, how else I was going to say that. But anyway, um, I do think that humanistic Judaism has a lot to offer. Um, and I think it's even different from super, super progressive uh, versions or denominations of other religions. Um, in so far as those super progressive, in my understanding, those super progressive denominations have at least stayed using the word God or whatever their like their words are, um, even if they're super progressive and liberal. And I feel like Rabbi Wine was urging us to go forward, so to speak, and not, um, not fall back. Because there is an, a, an attraction, a pressure to conform. And um, it would be sort of easier, perhaps, culturally easier, perhaps, to start using God. I, I see why they had you sign something that would have you not start bringing the word God back into your Siddur. So I think it's very good. Again, um, Hazak Baruch, <laughs> you know, that you're making all these awesome Siddurim and uh, a Haggadah and every, all the other cool stuff that you're doing. And I love it. Thank you, Aaron. Um, they, we have to, all all leaders um, at every level in the movement have to sign something that says we won't use the word God in our services or in our um, I don't know uh, what the in publicly or or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's not so much my siddur because they're not having they're nothing to do with my siddur really. Uh, my siddur is a personal project. Um, which a lot of people have asked me to do and to finish and uh, you know um, but it is really just an exploration of, of of what Judaism means to me and what and what to to fill means to me and um, you know these services and all of that um, yeah so it's not so much um, it's not so much connected to the movement I should make that clear um, but you yeah anyway um, Paula you've, uh, you had your hand up yeah, and we've had a lot of talk here about God, but not about spirituality so much. Um, humanism, I think, focuses on language a lot and how language is understood and how we feel about it. And we want to say things that we believe in, we believe what we say. <clears throat> but I think spirituality is nonverbal. And I think that why I'm enjoying all of this so much is because I'm groping towards something that's spiritual, that doesn't have anything to do with what prayer I say or whatever. It, it's, it's something else. It's something different. It's a belief. My personal belief is that everything is connected. Everything is one. I even feel that I have a, a physics uh, explanation for that, <clears throat> which physicists don't want to hear. But at any rate, I have one <clears throat> that I needed to work out because of a spiritual experience I had. <clears throat> which I've talked about before. And, and I just think that essentially the language in a sense gets in the way of, you know, you songs and the um, good that doesn't have words, although my favorite one has words, but it's just about music. It's not about, you know, religious in any way. Um, and so it's, it's, I can't tell you more about it. I just know that this is what I'm looking for and what I'm seeking. And it really, the verbal part really doesn't have a lot to do with it. But I, the reason I don't like to hear God is because there are so many assumptions about what that means. I don't like, as the English word, 
and I'd be happy to explore it in more Jewish words and, and Hebrew words and other words that might cut through that assumption business um, would be nice. But ultimately, it's not about language is how I feel. Yeah, I agree. So um, I asked my partner yesterday. Lechaim. Um, lechaim, lechaim. <laughs> what, um, uh, what meaning he found in lighting the candles on Friday night because he's fairly new to it. Um, and he does, um, he does find a lot of meaning in it. And he said, it's spiritual. It's, it's a, it's a spirituality that I feel when I do it. And, um, part of that is because I'm bringing, I'm bringing light when it's dark outside. And that's spiritual in a, in and of itself. And he doesn't need to say, he doesn't need to say any uh, specific words. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's I thank you for bringing bringing that up. That we're we're talking a lot about God, but not about spirituality, because that was one of the things that I asked. Okay, what is our spirituality? How how does it manifest? And that's a really good example. I mean, what you brought up, <laughs> yeah. Um, Phyllis? Um, yeah, to Betty Ann's point, um, I used to go to services only because of the music. I, I, I don't even know if I heard many of the sermons, to be honest. Um, I am a musician by training. My undergrad, one of, one of my majors in undergrad was music. Um, the other was business. Um, and I come from a very musical family. I majored in music behind my parents' back. Um, they were very much against me getting a music major as an undergrad degree. And so I just didn't tell them I was doing it. Um, I told them I was getting the business major, but I never told them I was also getting a music major. <laughs> and so um, music speaks to me in ways that um, that words don't. And so I love a Nagoon. I, I just think the Nagoon is like the central part of the service for me. Um, and it just speaks to my heart in ways that the words don't. And, you know, I, I love a Nagoon. I think it's the best part of the service, honestly. Um, I, I don't know. It, 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 it talks to me. Um, and I just, you know, I would invite everybody to just put the words aside forget the words, you know, <laughs> forget about it. Don't even think about them. Just, you know, allow your spirit to find some part of the service, even if it's just the color of the candle, the flame of the candle, or, you know, the color of somebody's clothing. Sometimes somebody comes in with a beautiful smock on or something. Lose yourself in some part of the service. Enjoy the spirit of the service. Somebody's clothing, whatever, you know, find some part of something that just transports you away and spiritually be involved in a service so that it's not about the words, you know, it's about the experience. That's my invitation to everybody. Look, I am. I am. Thank you so much. Uh, Judith? I like um, to put this in the context of why do we get together? Why do we form? community. And that's very difficult for us because we are so physically far-flung. Um, and I, recognize, I, I recommend to all of us to find some community that is physically near you because what we traditionally do every week is we say who is sick and needs help and comforting, which you do in a community. We, we, we say who is mourning and needs comforting, which, which is something that you do when you know people, you know, when you have a continuing community. 
but there's something else that's done in community which we can do, which is to renew ourselves and bring beauty into our lives as best we can, which is something that with your help, Martin, I think that we've done very well. Um, I am devoutly agnostic, um, but yeah, atheists and believers, very tolerant of you. Right now I'm reading poetry by Yahoshua November, who teaches at Rutgers and is Hasidic. And I feel so close to him. Um, and, and I'll send you um, physically close. He's at Rutgers. Um, you know, I'll send you some poems because it, it, it's so beautiful. We don't have to believe the same things to connect on, on some level. But I will say this, um, because many of us are meditators, and meditation is a singular practice. Um, decades ago, I, I went to a retreat and I had a really powerful experience of oneness that I've never forgotten. Um, and that, then I came home and I, I, I went to work Monday morning and some guy made some sexually insulting remark. And then I came home from class 10 o'clock at night and I was living in an SRO and my yogurt had been stolen. <laughs> and I said, all right, the world is one, but you still got to watch your back. Decades later, I'm working in the Bronx and, and I'm on a bus. Um, this was an era with really vicious gangs related around drugs that had initiation ceremonies. Um, you had to cut someone at the first rung and people were walking around with belts telling how many people they killed. You see, sat down in the fast food place and this guy next to you is wearing this belt telling how many people you killed. Um, so I'm on the bus and um, I get off the bus and I realize that the, the handle on my handbag has been slashed. Um, I, I always hold my hand back tightly, so um, I guess they couldn't grab it, and maybe their intention wasn't to grab it. Maybe this is the beginning of an initiation. And I'm really, you know, you know, you have that um, fear reaction uh, as, as I walk into learners to replace my bag and go on to my next appointment. But I realized that I also had this reaction of sorrow for whoever, and I never saw them did it, but whoever did it, I, I, and I don't know why they did it, I had this great reaction of sorrow. And, and I realized, yes, that was the lesson of oneness. Not that you don't watch your back, but so that one, this is acceptance of the evil in the world. And as I said, I'm agnostic. I, I, I don't know why the world is why it is. I have a strong um, predisposition to it's not planned, the probability, and we respond to it. And, and you know, our job is to respond to it maybe in a different way but Shabbat is that release for a little while from this world that we are one with and this struggle to make of ourselves something that's positive in in this world that for a little bit we rest 
And although we can't be the kind of community where we know everybody and run over with soup, which is Phyllis's style, I know, um, um, we can be the community that, that rests and brings beauty into each other's lives. Thank you, Judith, that was beautiful. Um, Nefaim, yes. Um, I think that I will close the discussion part. I think that was a really nice moment to finish it. So thank you so much, Judith. Um, We now turn our minds and hearts towards those who need our love, who are ill, who are lonely, who suffer pain, or who have been wronged. Please call out the name of anybody you're thinking of. For lavender. The morning sores of perpetual roses of Wisconsin. To those who long for healing, refuah with compassion and with feeling, we say refuah There's a light inside you that is there to guide you, to help you find the strength you need and may you feel a sense of peace and please stand uh, in body or spirit and say the name of anybody that you have lost that you're thinking of at this moment. Lawrence and Imo McCullough. May there be a good remembrance and compassion and kindness and love from all the world upon our honorable loved ones who are no longer present. Let us make a place in our hearts to remember their good names and let us honor them with good deeds. May their memory be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Yehena zichron tov vechesed verachamim veahava michol haolam lichvad auvenu sheenam ot avan inso belibenu et shemotehe matovim venokiram bimasim tovim zichronam livracha. Amen. Please be seated. Shalom, everybody. Bat shalom. Bat shalom. Well, see everyone later. <laughs> Bat shalom. Thank you so much. Bat shalom. Thank you, Martin. Every. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.